we're getting is groceries. Uh, and, and we just essentially want to be like this local network with all of the folks who are using our app, uh, getting, getting uh, food or medicine or groceries or pay to people at home. I'm David Ignatius, a columnist for the Washington Post. I'm pleased to welcome to Washington Post Live today, Dara Koshroshahi, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Uber. We're gonna have another in our series of conversations about the path forward. This one's gonna fo focus on the future of work, and we're gonna talk in particular about the gig economy, uh, what's happened to it and where it's heading. Uber obviously is one of the most important uh, symbolic companies in in that s sector. Dara, welcome uh, to to our to our Washington Post Live uh, setting. Uh, I want to ask you to begin with just uh, giving us a, a snapshot of what the pandemic has meant for Uber, uh, the number of drivers you had working in March, the kind of revenues that you were seeing, how many drivers are out now, whether you expect those drivers to come back. And if so, when? Just just open us up with a with a, a view of what this has meant for your business. Sure, absolutely, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me, David. It's a, it really is a pleasure. Uh, so the the pandemic has been very tough on Uber, as it has been for many companies who operate in the real world. You know, we're a technology company, but we're a technology company with our feet firmly planted in the real world. Uh, and as a result of the pandemic, we saw a very, very significant drop in ridership as everything locked down. Uh, so initially, we saw an 85% drop in volumes as people stayed home, and rightly so. Uh, and, and that volume has slowly but surely increased, although it is nowhere near where normal is. And, and for us, after the initial shock to the system, uh, th the most important factor for us was making sure that our service, because it is a daily use case service, um, when used would be safe. So providing drivers with uh, some safety net to the extent that, that, that they were feeling sick and needed to stay home, make sure that they had some earnings uh, to count on. We committed $50 million to health and safety supplies. We shipped nearly 30 million masks and face covers to drivers. And then we really shifted to making sure that we are there for the healthcare workers, providing them with free food, free rides, uh, and then supporting local restaurants by deliver uh, by waiving delivery fees for those rest uh, for those restaurants, about a hundred thousand independent restaurants that we work uh, with. Once we made sure that the service was safe, uh, we then turned to rebuilding. Uh, we see our rides volumes on a global basis at being around half of what they were pre-pandemic. And again, they started being down 85%. So cities are opening up at different rates. What's interesting is we've seen our delivery business, uh, Uber Eats, accelerate very, very significantly. We've had five years of adoptions essentially accelerate into six months. That business uh, has been a real lifeline for uh, many restaurants and many of our drivers who have, shipped, uh, who have switched over from uh, essentially carrying riders to carrying food. Uh, and that business has been a huge blessing. When I took over that business three years ago, it was a couple of billion in bookings and now its run rate is over $35 billion in bookings. So that business has really worked out well. But I'm looking forward to getting 2020 behind me, David. <laughs> I think we're all uh, feeling that that way. Just ask you to drill down a little bit uh, in terms of the driver uh, numbers. Uh, I'm curious whether uh, the drivers who've converted from the passenger carrying Uber to Uber Eats to all those ancillary services, 
make about the same amount of money that they did before, uh, whatever uh, percentage of their of their time they were devoting. And second, I'm curious whether you think the Uber Eats and other uh, delivery type businesses will now be a significant part of your company going forward. In other words, are we as a, as a, as a country, as an economy, going to shift more toward that kind of delivery rather than going to places to pick things up ourselves? So in general, pre-pandemic, you could make more money uh, working on the Uber ride system, typically on average, than being a courier for Eats. It's easier to be a courier for Eats. You can have an older car. Um, you can ride a bike, for example, e-bike and carry food. So um, usually drivers, mainline drivers, made more. Uh, that reversed itself during the pandemic, and actually there's an enormous demand for couriers uh, to this day, and couriers uh, are making much more money now than they were previously just because of the demand uh, for, the, for the service. Uh, as we're seeing demand come back for rides, that is reversing again, and it's my expectation that on average, uh, you know, driving people is a little harder than, than driving food. That is reflected in the economics and a driver driving for Uber rides can, can make more. Um, I absolutely do think our Eats business is now much larger than our rides business. I think going forward, uh, our Eats and rides business are going to be about 50-50 in terms of size. There's been a permanent acceleration as it relates to all things delivered to your home. Uh, what we see, the pattern is that consumers, when they try it, and they have been forced to try it to some extent because of these exogenous circumstances, they like it. It's a good product. Push a button, you get high quality food, usually within 30 minutes. The choice that you have, because basically every single restaurant out there is signing up for Uber Eats, they, it, it's a huge lifeline to, to the business. The choice is better than it ever has been. The convenience is very high. It's safe. And the food is really good. Uh, so we do think that some of this acceleration is going to be permanent, uh, and we are going to be the company that essentially anywhere you want to go in your city and anything you want delivered to your home, it's starting with food, but it's going to go into grocery, it'll go into pharmacy, it'll go into any other categories. Anything you want delivered to your home, we're going to be there uh, for you. That's fascinating. One of the things we keep hearing in our conversations about the path forward is that the post-pandemic economy is going to be different, that some of the things we've learned to do differently in these months uh, will, will stay with us, uh, creating new businesses, hurting uh, some old businesses. Before we leave the subject of, of the pandemic and what it's meant for Uber, I just want to ask you a question I know many of our viewers would want to ask. Just tell us a little bit about how you make sure that you can protect the safety both of your drivers and their their passengers every day, everywhere you are. How do you do that? So the safety of our drivers and the safety of our passengers is interlinked. Uh, you have to make big investments in, in both. We early on actually invested in technology that really was focused on a verification of the driver, making, making sure that the right driver uh, who has been licensed, who has been background checked, is driving the actual car. And it was basically selfie technology. Uh, you take a selfie of yourself. We make sure that it's not a picture of a picture, for example. We, you know, drivers have tried every single trick in the books to make sure that if Dara is supposed to be the driver that is picking you up, Dara is the actual driver. We then pivoted and are using that same safety technology that originally was about identity, mask. So now we are, uh, we have drivers uh, go through and take a selfie eventually, uh, essentially to make sure that drivers are wearing a mask. And again, you have people game the system. They try taking a picture like this, or they put a piece of paper in front of them, et cetera, in front of their mouth to pretend that it's a mask. Um, artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms learn the tricks of the trade. So now essentially our drivers, uh, through selfie technology, we guarantee that they wear a mask. Uh, and as it relates to riders, we ask the driver, first of all, we have a checklist, you know, wear a mask, make sure you're safe, make sure you don't have temperature, usually open up the windows uh, of the car and hopefully that'll be a reasonable ask as the weather gets uh, colder. 
if we see that a rider and we get that feedback from the driver isn't wearing a mask, we will then use that selfie technology for the rider on the next ride and the ride after that to make sure that they wear a mask. So it's like wear a mask, pretty simple. It makes life so much safer. And we're using technology now to make sure that we're the safest platform out there in terms of transportation. And let me ask whether you've been able to gather any data that would uh, uh, give any idea to, to your company, to the public about the incidence of infection uh, among drivers. It, it, does it mirror that of the country as a whole? The, these drivers are exposed to all sorts of people, obviously. W what, what do you know about, about the, the, the incidence of infection? We, we don't know much more in that we, we don't test drivers. Uh, so we are constantly sharing uh, let's say information to the extent that National Health Service asks us for information. Beyond that, we're very wary of privacy concerns. There's no reason um, or we see no evidence whatsoever to suggest that our service is in any way, shape or form unsafe. Let me shift, uh, Dara, to the broader question of, of the gig economy. As I said at the outset, uh, Uber is the kind of symbolic uh, company, one of, one of, the, one of them. Uh, you wrote a, a really interesting op-ed piece in the, in the New York Times back in August in which you tried to address a question that's been put forcefully to Uber uh, in California, but all over the country, which is why shouldn't you treat your drivers as employees? Why are they contractors? Uh, why not make them employees? And you gave a very detailed answer in that op-ed and in many uh, things subsequently. Get us started on that conversation by addressing the question you posed. Why shouldn't, why shouldn't they be employees of Uber as opposed to contractors? Sure, absolutely. So uh, I think generally stepping back, um, we come from a perspective that the employment system that we have in place now is outdated and it's unfair and that there's a class of employee who call it as the full-time employee who is a first-class citizen and then there are part-time employees or gig workers who uh, you can call them second class because they don't have access to benefits etc and there is one line of thinking that says well let's make them full-time employees so that they get access to the benefits but we think that's missing the point. The vast majority of, of uh, drivers or couriers who actually engage with our system do so because of the flexibility of the system. Uh, we had a survey in California where 88% of drivers who drive on our system in California do so because they want flexibility uh, as part of their needs. They may have another job, they may have a, a sick parent, or they may have childcare duties, et cetera. They turn to us because of the flexibility. If you turn a gig worker into a full-time worker, um, they will have to give up very significant flexibility. You know, um, a, a Starbucks uh, doesn't allow a barista to come in anytime they want in the morning, skip the noon rush hour because they, they want to take a lunch break and then leave and go work at a pizza in the afternoon because pizza is closer to home, right? We effectively do that. You can come onto the platform anytime you want. You can leave anytime you want. You can make your own hours. You can take vacation without asking your boss, et cetera. That kind of flexibility does not and cannot exist with full-time work. Sure, it's legal, but it's just not practical. No company in the universe does it. Because once you employ someone, you essentially have to become responsible uh, for their productivity. So that no company in the world creates, uh, offers the kind of flexibility that our gig work does. Now, if the vast majority of drivers want gig work and want the flexibility of gig work, our question is, well, why not put benefits and associate benefits with gig work? Why take away the flexibility when you can actually introduce benefits so our proposal is essentially what we call an independent contractor plus model, gig worker plus model that has all the companies that employ um, gig work and have drivers or couriers accessing their system to earn to essentially contribute to a benefits pool 
uh, and have that benefits pool be used uh, in any way that a courier or driver wants to, um, whether it's for healthcare or if it's for time off or it's for sick uh, leave, et cetera, plus some additional protections like accident co coverage, et cetera. So as opposed to kind of taking away this wonderful new technology that we built and this new way of working and taking it away, we're saying, why don't we add to it? Why don't we reform to it? Let's, let's actually connect benefits and flexibility together. We think that's a better answer. So one question I, I have about this approach, and you've described it uh, as a third way between uh, full employment and, and not being employed at all, this, this, this third way, uh, you would be required as a gig economy company to contribute to this benefits fund. And I, I wondered, why not make those benefits healthcare benefits, which uh, your drivers uh, are going to have, um, as opposed to money that's they can they can use as paid time off. They can use our one thing that we know about people is that if you give them a choice, sometimes they make choices that aren't really the best thing for for their health. Why not make it a, a, a just a standard benefit package like you'd get it at a, at a full time employer? I think it's a great great question, David. And 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 you're right that sometimes people make the wrong choices. But we want to meet drivers at where their needs are, um, not to make some kind of a political statement one way or the other. And the fact is that about three quarters of our drivers have access to health care. They may have a spouse who has a full time job or they may already have health care through uh, the Affordable Care Act, et cetera. They already have access to health care. So if we go out and essentially offer health care as part of the benefits, uh, we would not be helping out three quarters of our drivers and, and benefiting a quarter of our drivers. And we don't think that's, that's the best way forward. You know, the way we model our systems is that every single driver's needs and story are different. That's what makes our system so great. That, that's what makes the flexibility of our system so important. So just as the nature of the work itself is maximally flexible, we want to create a benefits package, which is maximally flexible and can essentially be used in the way that each individual driver or courier wants to use it. So one of the things that I think we've all been uh, feeling uh, as we live through the, the pandemic is the difficulty of people just having to fend for themselves, states having to fend for themselves. We look at, at countries uh, overseas that have uh, better, uh, stronger social safety nets, uh, sometimes with, with envy, gee, you know, it'd be, be nice to have more of that. As you think about how we're going to build forward, uh, uh, you know, perhaps with a new administration coming in in, in, in January, but in any event, uh, building the, the economy uh, back, how do you see in a, in a broader sense uh, providing a kind of a, a basic foundation for people, for their health, for their uh, some level of, of, of income security. Do you, do you see a, an economy that begins to look somewhat different and has more of those protections for people? You're asking me to get out of CEOville, David. That makes me intensely uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I do think, listen, for, for me personally, um, connecting healthcare to your employment um, from a structural standpoint and from a societal standpoint, I personally don't think makes a lot of sense. This is, uh, I think a lot of people know, um, companies attaching healthcare to employment actually came out of World War II when there were caps on federal wages. So it was a way for companies to get around these wage caps by providing these additional benefits. And it's resulted in a very, very embedded Byzantine system. Uh, and it's my personal belief that actually the system that you see in Europe and many other countries where healthcare um, is provided, a base level of healthcare is provided by the government, uh, allows you to have a serious scale and improve your, your pricing outcomes, while at the same time providing freedom for people to have additional healthcare or private healthcare as, uh, as well. It's, it's not one or the other. And I think that kind of a system is actually levels the playing field, uh, which I think will be very, very good for society and actually can create a more entrepreneurial society, right? One of, if you work for 
an Uber full time or you work for Google or Facebook, one of the real prospects that you face when it's time to when you want to go out and strike up on your own and, and start in a business is the prospect of losing your health care. And that's really serious, especially if you have a family. Uh, so I actually think that it would be a more fair environment. It would um, increase uh, or lessen some of the societal strain that we see as a result of these shocks to the system. Uh, and actually, it would create a more entrepreneurial society. Uh, so that's at least one person's viewpoint. So thank you for stepping out of uh, CEO mode. That's an extraordinarily uh, clear and interesting uh, way to think about the social safety net and preserving the entrepreneurial uh, dynamism that uh, that obviously is 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 crucial uh, for for our our uh, country our economy. I want to ask you about uh, Uber as a as an AI artificial intelligence uh, company. You know an awful lot about uh, where people travel back and forth. You've got presumably all that stored in in servers. Uh, tell us a little bit about how uh, you pl plan to use that immense uh, uh, cache of, of, of data as we move toward a, a, a future that looks more like driverless cars and trucks. Uh, how is Uber uh, positioned to, to move into that world and, and, let's be honest, make money in it? So I think that, first of all, we are um, incredibly careful about making sure that first of all our data is safe we have identity data we've got uh we've got payment data but we also have real-time location data uh and the real-time location data is is something that we uh protect and invest enormous amounts of money to protect and really hold them you know very dearly uh to make sure that it is used only when necessary and otherwise not used um the the most significant area where you, we use AI is uh, for simple things to really think about, well, how do we match up a rider with a particular driver? If you live at a particular place um, and you make a hail, there may be uh, 30 drivers whom we can match you up with. Um, our AI algorithms are constantly on a real-time basis, essentially understanding what is the perfect driver to match up with uh, with your request, uh, and then how do we route them? What's the estimate as far as ETA, et cetera? It's a lot of boring stuff, actually, uh, that that wouldn't occur to you. But if we get your ETA, if it's, you know, we estimated four minutes and it's actually seven or eight minutes, that's a very, very negative experience that, um, that we don't want to be associated with. We then furthermore look to personalize your experience. So when you come to Uber Eats, based on your uh, prior eating data, for example, what are the list of restaurants? Because sometimes choice, like you said, can overwhelm. Uh, and when we have a thousand restaurants available in a particular city, we wanna make sure that we show you the appropriate 20, 30, 40 restaurants. Um, and that takes huge compute power in terms of the loads on various restaurants, where our couriers are, what the expectation is as far as your delivery time and making sure that we use your past behavior to show you the perfect set and choice of restaurants. It's that kind of work right now in the background where our AI is, is maximized. Uh, and really the way I think about using this data is as long as we use the data to make the experience of the rider or the eater or the driver and the courier better, then that's use of data for good. Uh, what we do not want to do is essentially have that data take a toll out of that uh, experience or try to maximize value near term, because long term, we find that can be quite value destructive. Let me ask about another uh, area of, of social uh, policy, uh, future of our, of, our, of our society, where Uber has a particular leverage, and that is, uh, getting more toward a green uh, fleet of uh, cars and trucks, um, uh, reducing uh, uh, harmful emissions. Tell us a little bit about how you think as Uber CEO, uh, you can push the company in that direction and what uh, broader knock-on effect it might have. So we think that the future uh, for us is for transportation has to be uh, has to be shared. 
uh, cars are woefully underutilized. Car ownership is is a really bad use of an asset. It should be shared. It should be electric. And eventually, it'll be autonomous as well. Uh, robot drivers will be safer than, than let's say, uh, human drivers. On the sustainable side, as a team, we got together and said, listen, we're, we're running out of time. And we've got to make a move right now. Uh, so we very recently made a pledge uh, to be uh, essentially green or all electric on a global basis by 2045. Uh, in developed countries by 2035, and call the U.S. and 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 Europe, where where some of the sustainability efforts are more advanced. Uh, and in order to do so at these kinds of scale, we, we decided that you really have to make the economics work. So we are introducing Uber Green and expanding it across the country. It's, it's available now in many U.S. cities and essentially using that as a funding vehicle so that drivers on Uber who drive either hybrid or an electric vehicle actually get paid an extra 50 cents to a buck a trip, uh, sometimes a buck 50 per trip. And they can take those earnings essentially as incentive to electrify their vehicle. Because right now, a gasoline-powered vehicle is just cheaper in terms of upfront cost of buying that vehicle and then operating that vehicle uh, for its lifetime. Today, it's more expensive to go hybrid or electric. So we have created, through our product, essentially an incentive for our driver base to move to hybrid and electric. Uh, it'll add up to about $800 million in assistance that we provide to our drivers to move from gas power to electric vehicles uh, that we're going to provide really over the next 10 years. So sometimes you need a jolt in order to make the economic flywheel work. Right now, sustain it, the sustainability flywheel doesn't work yet, and we decided we've got to essentially make it work, uh, which is a big part of our sustainable uh, sustainability commitment. So what I would tell your uh, uh, folks who are watching this, if you see Uber Green, take Uber Green. It will help provide for a more sustainable environment going forward. Ask about it. another question that's on, I suspect, uh, every viewer's mind, and that's the election that's 30 days away. I'm not going to ask you a political question. I'm going to ask you about how Uber is going to help get voters safely to the polls on Election Day in this pandemic environment where we may be seeing resurgence in some areas. I'm sure you've thought about that. Talk us uh, through how, how Uber is going to try to, to help us as citizens and voters. Yeah, our agenda is to um, to get out the vote. Uh, however you want to vote is is a personal choice, uh, but we think more uh, more citizens engaging in the voting process is is a big big benefit. So you will see a pretty significant get out the vote campaign coming from Uber. Uh, we're essentially uh, making sure that polling stations are identified. Uh, we will be providing thousands of thousands of free rides to polling stations. Um, we're engaging with our own drivers to make sure that they can take a break and actually go out there and, and vote as well. Uh, so it's a very important partnership. We have a part uh, partnership with a number of players, including Power of the Polls, to essentially help recruit poll workers, make sure that poll uh, polling locations are identified, and then in many cases providing free rides to that poll for the citizenship and especially for those who need it. So, uh, Dara, this has been a really uh, rich conversation. We, we've uh, come uh, to the end of, of, our, of our 30 minutes. Uh, what we've hoped to do in these discussions is think with uh, leaders in American uh, business like you about, about what's ahead, about, about things that are going to uh, be changed because of the pandemic, new opportunities that have opened, and you've been uh, really interesting and provocative in your comments. So I, I thank you again for, for joining us uh, for the conversation today, and I hope we'll continue uh, to talk about these things uh, uh, in, the, in the months months ahead. So thanks, thanks to Dara. Uh, we uh, have uh, another uh, day of, uh, I hope, interesting uh, sessions uh, set for you tomorrow. Uh, please join Bob Costa at 9.30, who will be interviewing Senator Ted Cruz, uh, and if you can, join me 
at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon when I'll be interviewing Jim Clapper, the former director of national intelligence, who will be talking with me about election security. So uh, thanks again for joining us here today at Washington Post Live. See you tomorrow.